When you think of onboard chargers, what comes to mind? Power conversion? Yes. Reliability and dependability? Absolutely. Wide band gap materials? Now you're talking. Silicon carbide and gallium nitride bring a lot of benefits to onboard chargers, including an increase in power density, power reliability, and efficiency. But how can you utilize these next generation power technologies for your next EV design? You could start with this here chalk talk. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Stephen Hain from Infineon and I investigate the functions of onboard chargers and high voltage to low voltage DC to DC converters for electric vehicles. We also investigate the benefits that wideband gap power technologies can bring to these kinds of designs and the innovative solutions that Infineon offers for your onboard charger and DC to DC conversion design needs. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Infineon. Hi, Stephen. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, good to be with you. Excellent. Okay, so we're talking about onboard battery chargers and DC to DC converters today. But Stephen, before we dive into the details, talk to us briefly about both of these systems. Yeah, so the onboard charger, also known as the OBC for short, is a battery charger that converts AC from the grid to DC to charge the high voltage battery. Also, it's good to mention as well, the high voltage to low voltage DC to DC converter that converts high voltage to low voltages. These are kind of included in the systems together. They are separate units, but they could be included in one box as well. So it's good to discuss both. Fantastic. All right. So Steve, walk me through the processes of an onboard charger. So in an onboard charger, we kind of have two main stages or blocks as we kind of look at them. So we have the PFC, also known as the power factor correction stage. So this converts your AC to DC, and then you also have your DC to DC stage, which performs your high voltage to low voltage conversion, and then also adapts the current and voltage depending on the battery state of charge. It also provides you your isolation between the grid and your high voltage battery in your vehicle. Okay, so can you also explain the functionality of a high voltage to low voltage DC to DC converter as well? Yeah, of course. So it's important to include it in the system. It is not directly part of it, as the name includes, right? So they are different blocks, but now more integration is happening with the onboard charger. So the high voltage to low voltage DC DC is typically in one box now with the onboard charger. So it's important to explain the stage because it's included and it converts your high voltage to low voltage power for the low voltage battery and then also to provide power to other low voltage systems throughout the vehicle. Okay, so here on Chalk Talk, we have talked time and time again about the trends toward electrification in the automotive industry. And these trends definitely tie into this topic as well, right, Stephen? Absolutely. So we're targeting or seeing that people are moving towards electrification in the future, Kind of seeing that, you know, every second car by 2029 will have some sort of electrification. Now, not necessarily saying that will 100% be fully electric, but it could be a mix between, right, fully electric hybrids and different, you know, styles of vehicles to get to that. But home charging is going to remain a constant stay. The infrastructure behind fast chargers and charging stations isn't there yet. So, Onboard chargers in the vehicle are are going to be increasing along with these uh, vehicle demands. So the implications kind of for in the OBC with this are the cost, the size, and the weight. So similar like you see in everything throughout the vehicle, everybody wants it cheaper, smaller, and lighter. So some of the ways people are getting to that is by integrating multiple units into one box. So as mentioned previously, the low voltage DC DC converter into the OBC, but people also want it to be dependable and reliable while increasing efficiency. So that's kind of where the wide band gap devices come into play. So let's talk about these wide band gap materials. 
What kind of specific advantages would they bring to the table here? No, I'm glad you asked. So some of the key upcoming trends that we're seeing in the onboard charger that are direct, directly driven by the wideband gap materials are bidirectionality, power class increase, increase in efficiency, power density increase, and then the split between 400 and 800 volt battery classes. So within bidirectionality, we're seeing charging between the grid and the vehicle, and then also being able to support off vehicle loads. So such as power tools or home backup power. The power class increase we're seeing is moving from 3.6 all the way up to 11 or 22 kilowatts. And then we're also seeing the adoption of three phase designs, which is directly increasing the power class of the devices. And then we're also seeing the increase in efficiency, and this is directly driven by the wide band gap devices, which you know are silicon carbide and GAN, gallium nitride. We're also seeing power density increases. So integration of the OBC and DC-DC converters into one unit. And then we have the two battery classes. So we're seeing some split between the device voltage ratings and then the battery classes. So there's some split technologies that are better for different battery classes. All right. So Stephen, how are these high level trends playing out in real world applications? Yeah. So we're seeing first the bidirectionality playing out in the active front end of the PFC. So this, you know, ensures that we're complying with grid standards and interfacing the OBC to the grid. So that's what's happening in the charging and discharging direction of the, the power factor correction phase. And then it's also boosting and maintaining the DC link voltage. And then depending on whether we're in a discharge or charging direction, we'll either be providing or drawing power to or from our interface. The high voltage DC-DC in the onboard charger ensures you're isolated from the grid as well as providing DC link voltage and maintaining the charge to the high voltage battery. So Stephen, driving these trends here is the use of wide band gap materials. So talk to me a bit more about this as well. Yeah, so kind of how the power technologies break down. We have silicon, silicon carbide, and gallium nitride. Silicon is our most cost effective and also has the longest running manufacturing of the three technologies. So it's going to be your best cost option. Many people use it in a fusion approach. So using it in certain areas of the design and not everywhere. Next, we have, you know, silicon carbide, which is our best case for temperature and voltage. So silicon carbide scales well, and then also has good thermal conductivity with stable performance over temperature. And then when it comes to switching losses and integration, that's where gallium nitride is coming into play. So it offers the lowest switching losses and the highest efficiencies, but also has unique integration capabilities. So some bi-directionality and then also with gate drivers and other protection features included into it as well. All right, so Stephen, for silicon, silicon carbide and gallium nitride, what kind of specific design concerns should we keep in mind? Yeah, so when it comes to silicon, silicon carbide and gallium nitride, I think the first thing to start out when looking at the three different technologies is the switching frequency. It's the easiest way to first kind of distinguish where you want to start. So between, you know, 150 kilohertz and 350 kilohertz is where silicon carbide is going to end up kind of in that middle sweet spot. And then below that for lower switching frequencies, you're going to want to look at something like silicon. And then if you need to switch really fast or you're looking to really decrease the size of your design, you're going to look to use gallium nitride kind of above 350 kilohertz. So some of the trade-offs between each, right? Silicon is your lower cost used for lower switching. It's generally going to be used kind of nowadays more in individual portions of it and not the entire design of the OBC. There may be some select areas where you use it that are low switching frequencies um, where it would make sense where you can save cost. But to achieve overall increases in efficiencies, people are looking to use silicon carbide or even gallium nitride in the future. Right now, silicon carbide has a hold in the market. You know, it gives you good power density. You know, it's able to handle higher temperatures and the increased switching frequencies. But it also doesn't have too high of cost where gallium nitride is falling quickly and it does allow for system reduction costs. There's still the break-even point we're waiting for in the future of gallium nitride catching up to, you know, silicon as the target for the future. 
So given the three technologies we just discussed and how they play out into the OBC, I kind of want to look at some of the other topologies and how the different technologies could be used in the different designs that are in the OBC. So there's many different topologies and implementations of the OBC. There's, you know, single phase, three phase, multi-level, two level, there's matrix converters or single stage designs. Right now, silicon carbide is kind of the mainstay for kind of all designs. Low cost designs are still kind of owned by silicon, but there's still, you know, some silicon carbide taking over some of those shares. The economies of scale are playing into the factors as well. So moving forward in the future for 2027 and kind of until 2030, we're going to see silicon carbide kind of take over the market. GAN will start to creep in for more complex designs such as matrix converters or multi-level, but we expect those to kind of be few and far between until passing over the 2030 mark. Now, obviously, you can mix and match within each of these topologies. So I know that you're seeing the, you know, silicon or bright green or bright yellow orange, but everything can be mixed and matched kind of, which is shown in these other small supporting boxes here, depending on um, which design you want to implement. Stephen, there is some interesting recent innovation when it comes to onboard charging, right? Yeah, absolutely. So we kind of have our traditional two-stage topology, which you can see here. Now moving forward and looking into next generation, people are looking to implement a single stage. So a reduction of components, and this is all being enabled by GAN. So GAN has our lowest switching losses, but also due to the structure of the device, we're able to create a true bi-directional device in a single chip. So this is enabling for, you know, component reduction compared to a silicon carbide implementation of the single stage OBC. And then it also allows for performance improvements, right? So you don't need multiple devices in parallel to get back down to the same RDS on that you had when you're trying to do two devices back to back, where you're getting those efficiencies in the monolithic GAN device. So now when we talk about single stage, it's still not as simple as just saying, here's the one design and you're good to go. Following along the same path as the two stage designs that we looked at, the single stage, there's multiple different topologies that can apply to the OBC. Right now, we're seeing people in the market implement with silicon carbide as a first step. They're taking their known technology and then implementing into a harder design. And then we're seeing people also take the initiative to just go straight to GAN because of the technology benefits and efficiencies that are gained from the switching increases and the bi-directional properties of the devices. So there's system level increases on the power density, and then also it looks to reduce the cost, right? So with the size and then the shrinking of the magnetics, it's playing a much larger factor into the design cost than the semiconductor parts themselves. As GAN gets more mature, it's going to come more and more into cost parity, kind of with silicon carbide and silicon. Okay, so Stephen, how is Infineon supporting these kinds of applications? So at Infineon, we have application expertise, and then our goal is to always have the highest quality and reliability within our products. We also have a very large product portfolio, so we're able to cover pretty much all of the active components in the bomb. So we have the three technologies, silicon, silicon carbide, and GAN. We have, you know, all of the different components that can cover it from gate drivers to microcontrollers, sensors, and power, which was a main focus today. But we have all the key technologies and key components and packaging to bring it all together to kind of meet the high power needs, high power density, the higher efficiency, and then the cost that customers are kind of looking for in the future. And then kind of given the time constraints, I wanted to include the one last slide of the overview of our products. So we could spend many hours just going through one of the product families. So but we have everything to cover all the different stages from power to supply and control to gate driving and uh, sensing for different sensors throughout the entire design of the onboard charger. Fantastic. Well, Stephen, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Absolutely. Great to talk to you. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from Infineon. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. 
For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talk section of EE Journal. You can't miss it, it's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash EE Journal.